and a second reading for us this morning, and <coughs> a little different than what we normally read out of. This comes from the Common English Bible. This is Mark's Gospel, beginning with the ninth verse of the first chapter. About that time, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and John baptized him in the Jordan River. And while he was coming up out of the water, Jesus saw heaven splitting open, and the Spirit, like a dove, coming down on him. And there was a voice from heaven, You are my Son, whom I dearly love. In you I find happiness. At once the Spirit forced Jesus out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness for forty days, tempted by Satan. He was among the wild animals, and the angels took care of him. After John was arrested... Jesus came into Galilee announcing the good news, saying, Now is the time. Here comes God's kingdom. Change your hearts and lives and trust this good news. God, add God's blessing to the reading and the hearing, to the understanding, and when necessary and when appropriate for the doing of God's holy word. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray one more time. Father God, I thank you for this day, for your word, for the way in which it speaks. I pray now that you would would use me in some way to shed some light on that word, to use that word to encourage, to challenge, to give hope. Lord, in some way that we in this room would be transformed. God be with us. Amen. So we start Lent, and you're going to notice a theme over the next five or six weeks, and that's just going to be this one word that was said roughly about nine times by Cindy a few moments ago, covenant. Over and over and over again, we're going to say the word covenant. This week we start with Noah and his covenant, um, or the covenant that God provided for Noah, so we need to sort of know and unpack what this means. And, and I want you to think, because this is not a, a, a word. I would be willing to bet that outside of church and in situations on, in life that, that doesn't um, require you talking about the Bible, you probably have never said the word covenant. Um, it's not one of those words that sort of, we use contract, we use agreement, we use all these other words, but covenant. And so automatically you hear covenant and a lot of people start to glaze over. They just sort of fall asleep because it's like, all right, here comes the boring church words. Um, think covenant, simply think sacred agreement. That's all it is, is a sacred agreement, a covenant between two entities, and I'm going to say entities because we're going to talk about God's covenant with us a lot. Um, We're going to talk about God's covenant with Noah today. Next week, I think, is God's covenant with Abram or Abraham. Then the week after that, we're going to talk about the covenant as it relates to, to Moses. And so think simply a sacred agreement between two entities. And so today, between the two texts, between what Cindy read to you and what I read to you a moment ago, between the two texts, I think we see three signs of the covenant. Now the signs of the covenant simply point us to something larger than them themselves, than, 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 than just them, the entity itself, okay? So the first sign that we saw, the first sign of the covenant, of course, uh, it, from Noah's day, is the rainbow. Um, the rainbow. This, we see the rainbows even still today, right? We drive around. I newsletter article for this this month the the idea of of that chasing the rainbow that I was doing that one day and every picture I took I was stopped at a stop sign okay or at a stoplight I wasn't taking pictures as I was driving but but it was just this beautiful rainbow as I was heading over to North Charleston we still see them and when I see them I'm reminded of of what Noah saw and the promise that God made and I think that's a daily reminder that I sort of need or a a reminder that happens weekly monthly or however often It's, it's that nice reminder uh, of, of what God promised never to do again. Think about that. Think about this in light of, of, of Noah's uh, story in light of Lent. Uh, because we talk about giving something up. And in this story, God's the one doing the giving up. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, 
God promises never to wipe out life on the face of the earth through a flood waters again. Never to be vindictive because we have fallen astray in such a way that we're all wiped clean. That, that's good, good news. Right? I mean, that, that's got to be some good news. I mean, even the, 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 the most righteous of us, we look at the world and we go, oh man, this is, this is pretty bad. But God's promise never to wipe us out again. So there's, there's always, always hope for redemption. Always hope for redemption. Friends, that, maybe that's the first thing we walk away from listening here today when we think about signs of the covenant. The first sign is that none of us are so far gone. We've never done anything that we are so far gone that we're apart and outside of what God can do for us. Of what God will do for us. Now what's interesting about this first covenant that we talk about, this first sign, this first covenant involves only one party. That God makes a promise to us that says, I'm never going to do this. There's no stipulation on this. There's no like, you need to do A, B, and C in order to be able to stay from being wiped off the face of the earth through floodwaters. No, no, no. God says, I'm never going to do that again apart from anything. So when we talk about grace sort of falling down on us, we're, we're experiencing grace, and this is what, the ninth chapter in our sacred book? In the Bible, the ninth chapter of, of, I'm not sure how many chapters there are in the Bible, there's a lot. So the ninth chapter, we're already seeing grace that's basically saying, I'm going to do this for you, and you don't have to do anything else. I don't know about you, but I need a God like that every now and then that's going to step into my life and is going to say, it's not mattering what you're doing. I'm, I'm going to love you anyways. I'm going to provide from you, for you anyways. So this is our first covenant, our first sign. Now, now covenants happen between God and, and a lot of the times between all of humanity. This first one was between all of creation. So you had no, um, God promising Noah that, that all of creation, none of the, the creation would not be wiped away again through the floodwaters. And so this was this, on this grand scale. But I think covenant also, the covenant that, that we have, is also personal. And, and we see the second sign, the second sign of the covenant this morning when I just read to you about the waters of baptism. Because the waters, the sacred waters that we, we put into our little baptismal font when we pull it out, we've got a couple of baptisms coming up in the life of our church in the next few months. And, and that, that water that, that is just simply um, hydrogen and oxygen coming together, and it, it's nothing like mysterious about it. It's just simply water, the same kind of water you would drink from. But, but because we believe in, in God who, who uses symbols in order to point us to, to, to the holy things of, of life, we're going to pray over that and, and that water becomes sacred. And, and so baptism is a sacred agreement that we make with God. Have you ever thought about that? We baptize infants or, or, or young people. We don't uh, necessarily believe that you have to acknowledge sort of what's going on because our, our emphasis lies on baptism with what God has already done for us. Again, so this is grace. We come back to time and time again. And so by acknowledging what God has done for us, for you, for me, uh, we emphasize God's love on these little children. And if people are, haven't been baptized before and they come before the body, even as adults, our emphasis still lies on what God has done for you and I. And in that agreement, in that sacred agreement that we baptize, we put the water on the child's head and then as a group, as a community of faith, we commit or we make a covenant. We do this every single time we baptize a child. We say we are going to help you in whatever way. We're going to help these parents in whatever way we can to raise this child. Now some people, some people have issues with that. And that's why we get in trouble with some of our brothers and sisters in other denominations because they say, you know, you shouldn't really baptize babies. You should wait till they believe themselves. I'm okay with either way. But we do it because of what God has done for us. 
And because what we say as the church saying, we are going to covenant with you, we're going to commit with you in order to raise up this child. So the second one. So we had the rainbow, you've got water, and then the last one, the last sign of the covenant that we see today is the dove. As Jesus is coming up out of the water, we have this uh, miraculous sign. I found this image online. I actually wrote to the uh, artist and she gave us permission to use it. But um, the, the title's on the front of your bulletin. What's it called? Breaking Out. There's this beautiful image of, yeah, breaking out. This beautiful image of, of, of the dove and the rainbow colors. I felt like it encapsulated all of what we were thinking about today with these two scriptures. But this sign here for us, the sign is pointing, it's not the dove itself, the sign, the dove is actually pointing to the Holy Spirit. And so here in these two verses of Mark's gospel, the first chapter of Mark's gospel, in two verses you see the sun coming up out of the water, you see the dove, the Holy Spirit coming down, and then you hear God's voice. We call this the Trinity. We call this God in three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And right here, while the word Trinity never appears in the Bible, right here is where we draw this from. We pull this out. We say this is the Trinity. This is the God that we, that we worship, the God in three persons that's, that's uniquely one. And, and I could spend, there's like mounds of books I could sit and read to you all day long trying to explain this to you. But at some point in time, we have to just simply throw our hands up and say, this is a mystery. I don't understand how it fully works, but I know that there's a God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and in some way, shape, or form, what we see in Scripture bears this out. And this is the God that loves us. The God that sustains us. The God that created us. And so the Holy Spirit is present in the form of the dove. The dove is the sign. The dove is not the Holy Spirit itself because it's like a dove. And so this dove comes down... And, and, and sort of hovers over Christ. And then the voice speaks. And if you recognize this, if you go to Genesis 1, this is exactly how creation all began. Was that there was this hovering over the water and then a voice spoke and things became. And so now here in Mark's Gospel in the first chapter, this is the new journey that we're on with Christ coming into the world for you and I to walk this journey with us and eventually for us and this same spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness I don't know if I preached the sermon here I've preached one before but but I call it riding shotgun with the spirit because it, 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 it the spirits doing the driving and so Jesus is there having been baptized and immediately goes in order to prepare himself for the ministry that he would face into the desert to face temptation. Now Mark's gospel doesn't tell us much about it, but go to, to Matthew or to Luke and Matthew 4, Luke 4, both of those bear out the whole story and you know the three temptations that, they fa that Jesus faces with the devil and, and, and um, how he faces Satan down. Mark doesn't really want to worry us about details. He just simply says that he goes and he's successful. And he comes back and, and he's equipped. And he's ready. But what I think we can take away here is that, deep, that, that, that Jesus faced some demons. The writer Richard Rohr, Rohr says this. He says, if you face such demons in yourself, God can and will use you mightily. Otherwise, you will for sure be used. See, that's what happens with these temptations that we face. And when we're driven by the Spirit of God in order to go to a place that, that is going to challenge us in some way, be, bear me out. Now, listen to me here. I'm not saying that God's the one that's doing the tempting. We've already been over that. You can go back and listen to those sermons a couple of weeks ago. Instead, the Spirit drives Jesus to a place in which he faces this temptation. Doesn't say that the Spirit leaves him. Hear that out. That the Spirit stays right there in order to encourage, in order to, to strengthen him while he goes through this journey. I think we face this ourselves. That we are taken to, to hard places to deal with hard things, to walk with people through some hard stuff. At least I hope I hope that's the way the Spirit's using it. 
Because having been to these hard places, having seen some of this hard stuff, this is when God becomes all the more real. When we walk to these places. I talked to my mother yesterday. She called me and, and, and said that her uncle, Tom, had passed away and that uh, Tom is her last living relative, blood kin, other than my sister and, and I. And, and so my mom's gone through a tremendous amount of loss over the last few years. And so this is her last uncle and she passed, he passed away yesterday and she said, you know, it was, it was beautiful. Now my mom's a layperson. She hasn't been in these places like I have a lot of the times. And so she said, Brad, I, I got called in the middle of the night and I went up there and, she, and I sat and I held his hand and, and I pulled out uh, the scripture and, and I read Psalm 23 to him and I talked to him for a few minutes and the nurse said it could be anywhere from, from a few hours to a couple of days. And Brad, I read that scripture to him and 10 minutes later, he died. She said it was, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. He was going to a dark place that she would never want to go before, but knowing she did not go alone, that the Spirit had driven her all the way up to Anderson, South Carolina, in order to be there with her uncle, that she could walk that journey. And that Spirit there residing with her. The same way that the dove descends down upon Jesus and points him into the wilderness and says, Go. I'm going to go with you. Friends, I don't know where this Lenten season is going to take you. I don't know if you've given something up, if you decided to add something, or if you've thrown your hands up and said to the heck with all of it, I don't care. I don't know where you are with it all. But if you're going to go through some hard places over the next 40 days, know that God goes with you. Know that we've seen signs in our lives together and throughout Scripture that point us to a covenant that is much stronger than anything you and I would enter into alone. It's a sacred agreement. So, so here's the two questions I want to leave you with. Here's the two questions I want to pose for you to think about as you go from this place today. Covenant, if, if covenant's a sacred agreement, and, and you and I are here because we believe in God and because we profess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, what, what have you agreed to? What have you agreed to? Now some of you are like, I didn't agree to any of this. Well, maybe that's the point. Maybe there is an agreement that, that you and I need to enter into. Maybe that's what God is, is waiting for. I don't have an answer for that question. I got an answer for my second question. Because the second question is this. What has God agreed to? If this is a, a, a sacred agreement, what has God agreed to? And I think as we walk through Lent, we realize that, that, that God has agreed to go to the cross. To lay down God's own life in form of Jesus Christ for us. And that's a fairly, well, that's a large sacrifice. And we know God's promise. And so based on God's promise and based upon what God has already done, we know God cited the agreement. So the only question left to wrestle with is what are we agreeing to? I don't know what that means for you. But I'd like to believe that over the next 40 days, give or take a few, you'll get a chance to answer that question. What are you and God making a covenant about? Let's pray together. Holy Father, we thank you for your covenant, for your word, for your signs to us. Lord, we admit that sometimes we are Lord, that we're a little dense and that we need to be reminded time and time again of your love. And so we apologize when we fall short. 
but we're thankful that you do not stop pointing us in the ways in which you would have us to go. And so God, over the next 40 days during this Lenten season, we simply pray that you uh, would open our eyes, our hearts, our minds to all the ways that you would have us to work in this world, that, that there would be in some way, shape, or form a, a new covenant that would arise in each of our lives as we, as we make a sacred agreement with you. And maybe it's simply to love more or Maybe it's to extend a, an olive branch to, to somebody who's hurt us. Or maybe it's to, to spend more time in your word. Or God, I don't know. It could be anything. But for whatever that is, for each one of us, Lord, may it be holy. And may it be worthy of your love in our lives. God, help us in all that we do to be the people you would have created us to be. Nothing more and nothing less. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Deo, Deo, Daylight come and me won't go home. All the people say amen. Oh, 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 and all the people say amen. Give thanks to the Lord for his love never gone. And all the people say amen. Say, Amen. And all the people say, Amen.